crisis in Malaysia as a Filipino clan stakes an ancient and deadly claim to a remote corner of Borneo. Malaysia has responded with troops and fighter jets, a dramatic escalation of a bizarre three-week siege that's threatening regional security and stability. This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Jane Dutton. Welcome to the program. It was a, a brazen move that appeared to catch the governments of the Philippines and Malaysia off guard. A ragtag group of Filipino rebels pitching up in a seaside village on the island of Borneo and asserting ancestral ownership. The self-proclaimed Royal Army of Sulu are from the remote Philippine island province of that name. They made the short journey by boat to Borneo Island last month, landing in Lahadatu in Sabah State. The Philippines had urged Malaysia to show maximum restraint in dealing with the armed group, but the killing of a number of policemen has seen Malaysia respond with significant force. Florence Loy is in Sabah State on Borneo Island with the latest. Checkpoints set up to enforce a no-go zone. Shops here remain closed. This village is just 30 kilometers from where the Malaysian military launched an assault on an armed group that invaded the country more than three weeks ago. The gunmen took over a settlement, forcing people to leave. Calling themselves the Royal Sulu Sultan Army, they had sailed from southern Philippines to take over Sabah. Numerous deadlines to surrender passed. And on Tuesday morning came firm words from the Malaysian leader. We have the right to take appropriate action to defend our pride and sovereignty as a nation. A spokesman for the Sulu Sultanate confirmed Tuesday's attack, but also said the group had no intention of surrendering. They were hearing an exchange of small firearms. Yes, there were naval tanks and airplanes. On Monday, the Philippine Foreign Secretary had flown to Malaysia for talks to urge restraint. He's also asked that a humanitarian corridor be established to help women and children to escape the fighting. Both countries are keen to see that this crisis does not escalate. Malaysia is set to hold general elections this year, and the Philippines wants to ensure that a peace deal struck with rebel fighters in the south and brokered by Malaysia is not derailed. Some have criticized Philippine President Benigno Aquino for asking the Sulu supporters to surrender. We are calling on our fellow Filipinos that the fight of the Sulu people to reclaim Sabah is an assertion of the right to ancestral land. The Philippine government says it has not abandoned its claim to Sabah. In the interest of pursuing a good relationship with Malaysia, it had chosen not to press the issue. Now the brazen act of a few means it's become an issue that both countries can no longer afford to ignore. Florence Louis for Inside Story, Lahadatu, Malaysia. Well, let's bring in our guests from the Malaysian capital, Kuala Lumpur, James Chin, Professor of Political Science at Monash University and a commentator on Malaysian affairs. In Manila, we have Harry Roque, a law professor from the University of the Philippines. And in our London studios, Lee Jones, a senior lecturer in international politics at Queen Mary and Westfield University and author of the book ASEAN Sovereignty and intervention in Southeast Asia. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you. James, let's start off with you. What are you hearing about the attack by your government and what is going on in Sabah right now? Well, we're not getting the full picture yet. If I'm not mistaken, the army now, the Malaysian army now, is doing up mopping up operations. A truer picture will probably come in the next 24 hours. What we do know is that earlier this morning, uh, they launched a full-scale attack to retake all the areas that the Filipinos are staying in. And I expect there'll be more casualties within the next 24 hours. Why do you think they're keeping it so quiet? Uh, part of the reason is because I do not, I do not think that they want uh, any information to leak out. As you know, the Filipinos are actually linked and they're actually relaying reports of what's happening on the ground to television stations in Manila. So I think they're trying to keep a tactical advantage by keeping quiet. Right, let's go over to the Philippines then. And Harry, what is it that you're hearing about this and what is your government telling you is going on? 
Well, not much, no? primarily because Malaysia has clamped down on the media, no? which is why my organization, the Southeast Asia Media Defense, has called in Malaysia no? to honor and respect uh, freedom of expression and freedom of the press because that's the only way by which the Malaysians and Filipinos will really know what's happening. No? What we do know is that they have resorted to airstrikes, which means that there is now a breach of human rights law because the use of uh, airstrikes, in my mind, is uh, not proportional and it's not absolutely necessary. And because they used um, aircrafts also, no, they have also invoked the applicability of international humanitarian law, which now gives the obligation for Malaysian authorities to ensure the principle of distinction, meaning they should only target combatants and not um, innocent civilians. If they have broken international law, what could the Philippine response be? Well, uh, certainly they can prosecute them under domestic law, but as you see, the nature of human rights is that it operates as a, ba as a um, minimum, no, standards, no, which is applicable to all nations. It is a universal law, um, which is binding also in Malaysia. If they have really broken Malaysian law, then they should apprehend them, litigate, prosecute them, and punish them. No? But in my mind, there's also an issue of whether or not they're in fact violating law, because I think there's not much dispute that at some point in time, Sabah was in fact um, given to the Sultanate of Sulu. And the only controversy is the nature of a contract entered into by the Sultanate of Sulu with Overbeck and Dent no, of the North Borneo Trading Company, which was a contract of Pajak. The Malaysians claim it's a contract of session, whereas the Filipinos, especially the Tausugs, where the contract was signed, claim it's a contract of lease. And until today, there is a payment of a sum of money to the Sultanate of Sulu, which in my mind is more consistent with a contract of lease. Lee, do you think that's what it's all about? Is it all about this territorial claim, or do you think there are other players benefiting from this? Well, I think it's got very little to do with the actual uh, territorial dispute. I mean, the crucial context for all of this is the attempt to settle the long-running um, civil war in the southern Philippines in Mindanao. And last year, a framework agreement was concluded between the government in Manila and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And now this is an ongoing process where the exact details of the peace settlement are being hammered out. And it seems that the uh, clan associated with the Sultanate of Sulu has been excluded from these discussions or has not got what it wants in the, in the discussions. And so it appears to have tried to leverage this ancient claim, um, which has been silent on for the last 40 years or so, to try and, I don't know, c uh, compel some kind of concessions from Manila or embarrass the government or draw attention to its dissatisfaction at, at its exclusion from the ongoing process. So it has prompted uh, this crisis to try and uh, enhance its own leverage in these talks. Um, and it's a very ill-conceived strategy, and it's uh, gone disastrously wrong. Let's talk a little bit more about this territorial dispute, which can be traced back to the 15th century. Back then, the region was divided into two main Sultanates, and in 1658, the Sultan of Brunei gave an area of Borneo Island to the Sultan of Sulu. Borneo later became part of Malaysia, and Sulu part of the Philippines. Come 1878, a British trading company agreed to pay Sulu a nominal lease for Sabah. Years on, Malaysia still pays Sulu some $1,500 a year. Now, modern-day followers of the self-proclaimed Sultan of Sulu, Jamalul Kiram III, are reviving their ancestral right to the region. If Malaysia, James, is paying them a token fee every year, then Malaysia agrees that they have a right to this ownership. Well, I don't think so. I need to reply to what my Filipino colleague was saying about Malaysian breaking international law. I think that's one perspective where I happen to think that that perspective is wrong. If you look at the chronology of events, it is very clear that the Malaysian authorities working together with the government in Manila try to find a peaceful way out of this. The Malaysian government actually gave the intruders several deadlines to ask them to, peace, to live peacefully. And every time they were asked to live peacefully, these people refused to do so. The military action against the intruders only took place after they shot and killed eight policemen on the Malaysian side. So I don't think that you can blame the Malaysian authorities for taking this course of action. On to your question, I think it's also debatable whether the Sultan of Sulu has a claim on Sabah. I think we have two issues that we need to resolve uh, fairly quickly. One is the fact that the Filipino government 
uh, since Malaysia became independent in 1963, has decided not to pursue this claim actively. That's number one. Secondly, I think it's also quite clear that we do not know who is the legitimate Sultan of Sulu today. Uh, the current Sultan of Sulu, who claims to be commanding the troops in Sabah now, his, his position is actually disputed by several other people. The last time I checked, there was about six or seven claimants to be the Sultan of Sulu, and in fact, a few of them are actually living in Sabah currently. I want to tell you about some of the reaction we've been getting on Facebook, which I want to put to you. Napsia Wan Saleh says, Malaysia has the right to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. The armed Sulu group used sniper fire to kill six Malaysian policemen and used mortars to kill two Malaysian police commanders. Vincent Lee says, we Malaysians do not tolerate this kind of assault. The question is... How did Malaysian Marine Forces allow them to enter, not just once, but continuously dropping more troops in Sabah? Suzanne Oskan tells us they should sit down and negotiate a solution for the problem before it escalates into bringing even more civilian deaths. And Kelsey Wilson-Cox adds, hmm, aircraft strikes and well-formed ground troops versus 200 self-proclaimed soldiers. Yep, that's fair if you live in Syria. Lee, can we assume that they have people to call on in Malaysia to support them, the invaders? Uh, probably not. I mean, uh, as my Malaysian colleague has just pointed out, this uh, is a very fragmented group. There is no one uh, particular sultan. Uh, this is a hereditary claim. Uh, the sultans do not command uh, a massive popular following. Uh, and there are lots of rival claimants. So even if there is some kind of transboundary uh, following, uh, it's also likely to be fragmented among the different claimants. Whatever the reason, James, it's a, it's a little bit embarrassing for the Malaysian government, isn't it? It says a lot about the lacks of security, for example. Well, you have to understand that the people living in the southern Philippines in the Sulu region, uh, they have never really understood the political boundary between Sabah and uh, Sulu. Uh, for years now, it has been possible for you to take a boat from the southern Philippines uh, to uh, Sabah without a passport. This has been going on for many, many years. And in fact, if you look back further hi in history, uh, when the moral conflict started between uh, uh, southern Philippines against the rulers in Manila, a lot of the fighters were actually uh, using Sabah as a base for operations. So this thing has been going on for the past 30 to 40 years at the very least. So I'm actually not surprised that they found it very easy to come across. Harry, that's a, a crucial point, isn't that these Sabah fighters were used in the past by the Philippines government. And when it backfired, they allegedly had them killed. And this has borne the fruit for much of the rebellion against the Philippine government. Well, yes, you're referring to the Jabida massacre, no, where the former dictator Marcos apparently was training special commandos no, to reclaim Sabah. No? But you see, as a result of that incident, Malaysia retaliated by funding all the insurgents in Mindanao seeking to overthrow the government in the Philippines. That's public knowledge in the region. Without Malaysian support, there would not have been the Moro National Liberation Front. There would not have been the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And that is why I'm very much surprised that the Philippine government actually allowed Malaysia to be um, part of the peace talks, knowing very well that Malaysia is not a disinterested third party. Many of the diplomats that I know have said that they would have preferred Indonesia, but Malaysia, of course, volunteered to be facilitator. No? But let me correct some of the information that was mentioned by my two colleagues. No? It's not true that the claim is dormant. As late as um, the late 90s, no, we intervened in the um, case between Malaysia and Indonesia on Sipadan and Lipadan, precisely because we wanted access to documents that would prove our, tale, our, our title to Sabah. And these are the same documents that Malaysia is proving its claim to, the, uh, to Sabah and uh, to the two disputed islands. No? And prior to that, Fidel Ramos no, has always been consistent that he was um, espousing the claims of the uh, Sultan of Sulu um, at, as far as the proprietary interests are concerned. No? It's only, in fact, in the administration of uh, Noinoy Aquino that the uh, claim has not been actively espoused. And part of it is because of the Malaysian role in the peace talks. What do you think of that, Lee? Well, we need to be clear about what the issue is here. This is not a question of a territorial dispute between two nation states, the Philippines and Malaysia. This is about the Sultan of Sulu saying that his claims 
to his ancestral lands across the border in Malaysia should be factored into the ongoing peace process in Mindanao. That is the fundamental claim that the Sultan is making, and that's being left out. It's been left out because it's too awkward. And the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, which is the main insurgent group in the southern Philippines, also does not want to try and revive a Muslim caliphate that spans the territory of, of Malaysia and the Philippines. It knows that is unrealistic. It is quite happy to confine its claims, the Bangsamoro area of southern Philippines. So that is what this dispute is about. It's about subnational groups vying with each other to position themselves for a post-conflict settlement where they can get maximum control. And that is this weak group, the claimants to Sulu, that are trying to leverage this ancestral claim. And it's the ancestral claim that's, dom that's dormant. But don't you think leaving out the Sultan Sabah. in these peace talks, it's clearly backfired now? I mean, Philippines is awash with these Muslim militants, and now they have one more group. Well, I think a wash is um, a massive overstatement. Um, and I don't think that the Sulu group is, an, is some kind of Islamic uh, insurgent group either. It's also not true that they've been completely left out. Um, the degree of consultation is questionable. Um, but according to uh, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, um, the Sultanate is, has been um, you know, consulted on a number of occasions. So to me, I think this is probably more about as we're seeing the fine detail of the post-conflict settlement being hammered out, you've got to remember that all peace settlements are not just about ending a conflict, they're about setting the distribution of power, control over resources, patronage networks and so on in the post-conflict environment. So this is about a struggle to position themselves in the new uh, post-conflict setting. So that is what this conflict is, is really about. Um, and the Philippines knows that it has to deal with the major players on the ground. And this rather ragtag group is probably not um, going to be allowed to, to spoil the process. James, what do you make of Harry's comments about Malaysia using this for their own gain? I'm At the not cost sure of the, the Malaysians are using... Um, I doubt it very much. As you know, Malaysia has been in the election mode for the last two years and we have an election coming up next month. So I doubt very much that the Malaysian authorities had a hand in this current intrusion. What I can but, say but is that Malaysia is interested... But by getting involved in the peace interested. talks, the Philippines is not going to raise this issue anymore about Sabah's claim uh, no, to I, that I, land. I, again, I, I, I have to disagree. I think the reason why Malaysia wants to get involved in the peace talks, just like they're currently getting involved with the peace talks in southern Thailand, is simply because they want stability. Uh, Malaysia is a country that believes strongly in economic growth, and they know that one of the prerequisites of economic growth is peace and stability. You have to remember that a couple of years ago, there were lots of kidnapping in the Sulu region, and some of the effects spilled over to Malaysia. Uh, for example, when there was a kidnapping on the Malaysian island, uh, a couple of years ago by Filipino rebels. Uh, many Western countries put out travel advisories telling the citizens not to go to Sabah. And the Sabah tourism trade actually collapsed shortly after that. So I think there's lots of economic interest at stake. I just want to come back to what Lee said earlier about people positioning themselves for post-conflict or post-agreement. I think there's an element of truth in it. Uh, one of the things they're looking at with the current framework for agreement is that they're looking at massive economic development. When you're talking about massive economic development and creation of an autonomous region in Mindanao, uh, you're talking about a lot of money pouring into the region and the new political structure and the new political elites will decide who gets what. And the sort of money we're talking about is a lot of money. The sort of money we're talking about is the sort of money that Mindanao has never seen. So I think there is an economic dimension to the current conflict. Lee, you seem to agree with that? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, th we see this in all, uh, all areas that are transitioning from conflict to peace. We saw it in Acho, for example, that essentially what, what the peace negotiations are about is deciding who rules afterwards, who has control over local flows of patronage, resources, um, political appointments, and so on. And so people are jockeying for position. So what I see this, uh, it, this series of rather bizarre incidents really being sparked by is one small player in this uh, not being very happy about the way that the peace process is going, that they're being either excluded or they're not getting enough benefits or whatever. And so that's why they're trying to escalate this uh, long-standing uh, dispute over territory into something more 
uh, serious and significant. But I, ca I can't see it working. The main groups, which are the Philippine government, the Malaysian government, and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, are not going to allow uh, the Sulu group to, uh, to derail the process. I think too much is at stake on all sides. Um, but it so certainly seems that some parties that are, are taking advantage of this, excuse me, jumping in, because uh, as we've been saying, the issue has come at a critical time for Malaysia and the Philippines. The two nations have much in common, but the sub territorial dispute has been a thorn in relations for decades. The neighbors are founding members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and share a long history of diplomatic ties. Malaysia has been brokering peace talks between the Philippine government and the largest Muslim rebel group, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, since 2001. And both have elections coming up with a lot riding on how this whole issue is resolved. I mean, James, if we could deal with one of the conspiracy theories, the government is blaming the opposition for being in cahoots with the invaders. Is that a possibility? Uh, no, I think that is uh, propaganda by the government. Uh, it is quite clear that the opposition was not involved. Uh, the other conspiracy theory that's going around on the internet is that this was a conspiracy hatched by the previous uh, Arroyo administration in Manila to embarrass the current president. Uh, I don't take this, serious, this story seriously. But it could work in his favour, couldn't it? I mean, there's talk that he could be calling on a, a state of emergency and, and that could de delay the elections. Is, is that possible? It is possible, but it will, he has to pay a very high political price for that. And if he were to declare a state of emergency, he can't declare for the whole country. He can only declare for the state of Sabah. Harry, you going to say something? Yes, well, um, I think we're reading too much in the framework agreement. No? What I have learned from people who were there in the negotiations is that it was, in fact, Malaysian authorities that was ramming it. No? And the reason was became very apparent after it had been signed. Prime Minister Najib, because there is an election, was claiming credit for it. And more importantly, he was courting the Filipino vote in the crucial state of Sabah. No? In the last elections, there's even a, an entry on WikiLeaks saying that uh, the UMNO uh, resorted to vote buying in Sabah. No? And now, of course, you hear the same uh, Prime Minister Najib saying that the likes of Anwar Ibrahim is involved in this issue, which, of course, is incredible. No? I think there's more political... Um, gain for UMNO to have Sabah play out in the manner that it is than for Philippine politicians, quite frankly. Harry, what sort of impact do you think this will have on politicians in the Philippines? Many people there felt that the government should have stepped in and protected their nationals. Well, that's true. Now, you have to remember, though, that um, um, President Aquino does not really have any political risk because he's not standing for election. No? The elections are for the Senate and local officials, not for the president and the vice president. So he doesn't really have much uh, at stake by um, dealing with this crisis now. And I myself think that he should be doing more, especially now that uh, resort has been had to um, airstrikes. No? Um, if the Philippine government cannot um, um, uh, protect its nationals, who will protect these nationals? No? I think he should do more in preventing further harm and ensuring that both human rights law and humanitarian law are in fact respected by both parties at this point in time. Lee, do you think both countries are going to be mature enough, realizing that they've got too much to lose to allow this to escalate any further? Well, they already have been. I mean, the Philippine government has basically stood shoulder to shoulder with the Malaysian government on this. So the president uh, on the Philippine side has said that the group should surrender and anybody in contact with the group should encourage it to surrender unconditionally. Um, the Philippine government is not particularly protesting the rather harsh and brutal way that the Malaysians have chosen to resolve um, the problem and that is simply because uh, the relationship with the Malaysian government is too important for the settlement in Mindanao. So Malaysia has been brokering uh, the peace talks for a, a considerable length of time. Malaysia is the main uh, the lead group with the international monitoring uh, team which oversees the ceasefire in Mindanao. So the Philippine government cannot afford to alienate the Malaysian government by allowing this to escalate. Um, but equally the Malaysian government does not have any interest in uh, having a, a spat with the Philippine government either. Okay, and we're certainly going to be keeping an eye on this and hoping that, Lee, you're absolutely right. Thanks very much for talking to us, all three of you. James Chin, Harry Rocker, and Lee Jones. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.